<coughs> Have you ever heard of storm chips? Oh, they're, they are potato chips made near Heartland, New Brunswick by the uh, Covered Bridge Chip Plant. As you know, just a couple of weeks ago on the uh, news that that plant burned with fire. Uh, they, uh, that particular family, the Allwright family, they raise russet potatoes and the potatoes they raise are used to make these, uh, these chips. They are old fashioned kettle chips and uh, they make it in such a way as to uh, have the best flavor and texture to the chip. If you buy a bag of storm chips, you'll find there's four different kinds of chips in the one bag. There's dill chips and ketchup chips and smoky barbecue chips and salt and vinegar chips. They're all in the one bag. It's a great big bag. And a matter of fact, uh, there's so many chips in the bag, it's equivalent to eight regular sized bags of chips. You'll have a hard time to find them now since the plant is burned down, but they're going to erect it again. So when a storm is coming, uh, get some storm chips and, and hunker down and, and cozy up for the bad weather and comfort yourself by eating potato chips. <laughs> Interesting, isn't it? Well, you know, there's a number of storms mentioned in the Bible that were pretty dramatic. The storm of uh, when Jonah was on that ship, headed in the wrong direction. Uh, that was a quite a storm. And then, of course, there were the disciples. And you remember, it was pretty bad. And, and uh, they saw a ghost, they thought, coming on the water. And, and they found out it was the Lord. And Peter said, bid me, Lord, I come. And remember, Peter walked on the water. And the one before us this morning, of course, is St. Paul. St. Paul had been arrested for the preaching of the gospel and his lifestyle. And when he was arrested and being tried, he appealed to the Supreme Court. As we would say today, he appealed as a Roman citizen to the high court in, in Rome, Italy. And uh, as a result of that, he was put on a ship and he was on his way to Rome. And of course, as they got on the ship and were traveling to Rome on the Mediterranean Sea, a terrible storm came up. We would call it a nor'easter. Uh, and uh, boy, they got into big problems. The storm was so bad, they could no longer steer the ship. That tells us that in verses 14 to 15. And, and it got so bad that the wooden ship, they took ropes and put it around the hull so it wouldn't break apart the ropes and, and wouldn't destroy and sink the ship. I, I don't want to talk necessarily a whole lot about what happened with Paul on that ship, but let me briefly say this, that uh, uh, how they survived here in this story is the same way that we ought to survive when we go through storms. And there are other storms, you know, uh, that are different than atmospheric disturbances, than wind and, and, and rain. As a matter of fact, uh, you all heard that song written many, many years ago, back in the 1800s by Edward Hopper. It says, uh, Jesus, Savior, pilot me over life's tempestuous sea, unknown waves before me roll, hiding rock and treacherous shoal, Chart and compass come from thee, Jesus, Savior, pilot me. What can we do? To, what can bring us comfort in the middle of the storms of life? I want to talk about storm chips for your troubled times. There's a few things I want to mention here. And the first thing is this. I want to talk about unsuspected weather. There was unsuspected weather. Now, you know that I spent a few years at pastoring a church on Campobello Island, and it was full of fishermen. As a matter of fact, on the side of the island where I was, uh, myself and one other man during the week, we were the only men on that end of the island. They were all gone out to sea, of course, in their vessels. And I know something about fishing, uh, practically speaking. I know the thing that the fishermen checked over and over again before they went out on the water of, of the Bay of Fundy and so on, was they checked the weather. Uh, they never set sail without the weather. And if the weather didn't look real good uh, and they, it was too much, they wouldn't leave, they wouldn't leave the wharf uh, or they wouldn't leave the dock. I remember as, as a young man and then as a groom and as a father, I expected my life would be pretty pleasant too. <laughs> I thought it would be filled with joy and satisfaction. I figured that Hard times would happen to some people, but hard times would never happen to me. You know, bad events and sickness and, and things, others would have all of that, but I figured that I would be exempt. William uh, Cower said this, he said, God moves in mysterious ways, his wonders to perform. He plants his feet, his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. And our best laid plans and ideas sometimes go AWOL and don't measure up to our dreams. And St. Paul's the same way. They got on this ship and they were headed to Rome and they weren't planning on bad weather. And all of a sudden, weather, bad weather arose on that sea. The late preacher John Calvin said, 
God so attends to the regulation of individual events that they all proceed from his set plan that nothing takes place by chance. Now, I don't know about you, but I love surprises, but I don't like negative surprises. Negative surprises really hurt. And this was a negative surprise for Paul. And, and, and God said through Peter, he said this, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial that is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. Sometimes when things happen and people get in the midst of trouble, of course we say, why me? We know that the Lord orchestrates the events that we can't control. Uh, we have to learn to trust disruptions and, and, and divisions and, and detours. And we have to remember that sometimes our breakdowns lead to a breakthrough. We have to think about that. Every apparent disappointment has a purpose, according to R.J. Morgan. The point is this, that uh, <laughs> when your plans collapse, don't collapse. When your plans collapse, make sure you don't. Don't get sour. Don't get angry. Don't get depressed. Don't get negative. Don't get bitter. Because all things work together for good to those that belong to the Lord. Paul didn't lose it. We didn't read every verse here this morning, but, but Paul didn't get angry. Uh, it, that's just the way. And this was a multiple day event. This wasn't something, a storm that blew in in the night and was sunny again in the morning. This went on for a few days. And it seemed that, where was God? You know, sometimes God works awful slow. Have you ever noticed that? The Christian life requires patience and trust in God's infallible timing. Wow. That's why it says, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we will reap if we faint not. So when storms come, don't quit. Don't stop trusting. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast. Wow, that's hard to do. Unmovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. The late Dr. Lehman Strauss, I was in a meeting one time where he spoke and he said, God rarely uses a man greatly until he hurts him deeply. Do you get that? God rarely uses a person greatly until he hurts them deeply. I know the psalmist David said, wait on the Lord and be of good courage and he shall strengthen thine heart. And then he said again, wait, I say on the Lord. Sometimes that's pretty hard to do. When you're waiting, don't, don't, don't lose your equilibrium. Don't lose your mind. The psalmist said, I waited for the Lord. My whole being waits. Uh, and then it goes on to say, and in his word, I put my trust. When I was a young kid, I went to a boys club. And our theme in the boys club was Isaiah 40, 31. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles and all that. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So what is the first thing you need to know when trouble comes so that you, you don't go to pieces in the middle of the storm? Just remember that what's unexpected to you is not unexpected to the Lord. God's in control. The course of Paul's life was being driven by circumstances and God was driving the circumstances. Wow. Many of uh, preachers read a writer by the name of Arthur Pink. Arthur Pink was an English Bible teacher. He died in 1952. It's said that he was one of the most influential evangelical scholars in the second half of the 20th century. And uh, Mr. Pink said this, if only we realize that everything which enters into life is ordered by God, and if we acted in according with this, then we should maintain our composure and conduct ourselves with unraffled serenity. Wow. Uh, it does say in the New Testament, doesn't it? Talking about the tongue, it says that everyone be swift to hear and slow to speak, and then slow to wrath. Don't, don't get mad at God when, when something happens. It's important to life in life. To, as Paul was here, to be plain spoken, but not to be unpleasant. Paul said what he had to say, but he didn't rupture any relationships that he had with people. So storm chips in the middle of a difficulty, a storm, a sickness or whatever, it might be that, that God brings our way. Just remember that it's all a part of God's plan. It's unexpected weather. You didn't order it. It happened, but there's a purpose for it. We have to trust God for that purpose in our lives. Let me say a second thing that happened here. We read it this morning. 
The storm got so bad, they started unloading the ship. I call it unnecessary weights. Now that happened to remember in Jonah's day. Uh, remember Jonah was down in the belly of the ship fast asleep and these mariners were trying to keep the ship from going down. They thought they better lighten it because the, the, the ship was so far down in the water that the waves were coming over top of the bow of the ship. So they, they threw all the cargo out. And that's what happened here. They threw, they threw everything overboard. The ship was loaded. <laughs> and I suppose they were afraid that eventually it's going to be submerged. So all the cargo, all the tackling, and all the food, and, uh, you know, life was at stake. <laughs> Come on, I, I throw it overboard. So they did. I call it decluttering. Coming up to spring, thinking to myself about the need for, for decluttering at the house. I was reading the other day a fellow who's a pastor down in the southern states. His name is Rick Warren. Rick Warren said this, and it's a great statement. He said, storms can cause me to discard what I used to value. Get that? Storms can cause me to discard what I used to value. Would you not agree when there's things in our lives that are, that are weighing us down and, and, and keeping us from becoming all that we should be and living a vibrant Christian life? That if those things are weighing us down, they got to go. They, they, they got to be thrown overboard. <laughs> all, uh, <laughs> what, what's God say about this? You know, it's true that if we lighten our ship, we brighten our lives. Now, there's more things than, than tackle than chains and, and loose things on the deck of a ship that need to be thrown overboard. Let's talk about some of the immaterial things that need to be thrown overboard because they're mentioned. They're mentioned in Colossians 3. It says, but now you yourselves put off all these and then it mentions a bunch of stuff. One of the things it mentions is anger. I don't know if you're angry, angry at anybody or not. <laughs> one of my, one of my uh, fellow Bible teachers, Ray Pritchard, he said this. He said, it's amazing. We have conquered outer space, but we can't conquer inner space. Isn't it something? We, we, can, we can conquer outer space, but we can't conquer what's going on in here. And we're mad at somebody. We're perturbed at somebody. Mr. Pritchard went on to say, what we are inside matters more than what happens outside. End of quote. It's true. Sometimes uh, when things happen, we're awful quick, aren't we, to respond. Quick speaking leads to, to quick anger. It says in Proverbs 16, whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules the spirit is better than he who takes the city. And then sometimes we have a problem with malice. Malice is kind of a, a vicious disposition where we have an attitude of ill will to others. You know, we'd be kind of glad if something really happened to them. And then uh, blasphemy is a word doesn't just refer to swearing. It refers to, to slandering and insulting others. And filthy language is another thing mentioned in that passage. That has to do with obscene language. The Weymouth translation calls it foul-mouthed abuse. Then another thing we should throw overboard in our lives is, is worry or anxiety. We need to get rid of that. Casting all your care. There, there, get rid of it. Casting all your care upon him for he careth for you. Wow. And then there's bitterness. Oh, man, that's a tough one to deal with, bitterness. Bitterness. It's, that, it's those hurts that we have that others have inflicted on us. And we end up being bitter towards it. We, we become grapefruit Christians. Ever met a grapefruit Christian? Lots of them around. Yeah, lots of them around. When storms come into our lives, I think we need to check our heart. It's a good time to take inventory to see if there's something in there that is hindering or slowing down our progress for God. Listen to this. We gain by losing and we thrive by pruning. Got that? We gain by losing. Get rid of this stuff. And it says, and we thrive with pruning. Now on this boat that Paul was on, there's 276. You say, how do you know it? Well, it's in verse 37, gives the number, 276 people. So they must have had a lot of cargo on there. Uh, I was just uh, thinking about it, if it was an airplane, that'd be a lot of suitcases, wouldn't it? I wonder if everybody had some kind of a suitcase. And if there's a bunch of women on there, they probably had five suitcases. Well, you're just, I'm just joking. You know, that's, that's the way it is. Uh, there's a lot of cargo there. <laughs> I have a friend who lives over in Carlton County. He lives in a little community called Somerville, which is kind of close to Heartland. And uh, he, he's a missionary. Uh, he's a missionary from Canada. 
and he sends out uh, letters. And I get his I get his missionary prayer letters. And he always puts this on the bottom of his letter. This is really interesting. He says this, live simply so that others can simply live. You got that? Live simply so that others can simply live. Now, I know where that guy lives. And he and his wife have only simple things in their home and simple possessions because their goal in life is to use as much of their money as possible to get the gospel out to the country of Bolivia, South America. Wasn't that something? You know, some of us are really cluttered, aren't we? And, and it hinders kind of our Christian progress. Remember this verse? It says, he who received the word among thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this life and the deceitfulness of riches. What do they do? Choke the word and that person becomes unfruitful. The deceitfulness of riches in our society, everybody's trying to get more money. That's what it's all about. And I'm afraid it often, you know, the love of money is the root of all evil which while some have coveted after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. And we know the verse that says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You know, only a few things in this life really matter in the light of eternity. Only a few things. Storm chips for the troubled times. What are some of the storm chips? Well, when things happen that we don't like and we're in the middle of a storm, remember that God has the unique ability to take that difficult time and work it in our lives for our good and his glory. And I think you should remember that when you're in the middle of a storm, it's a good time to say, are there things in my life I need to throw overboard? Do I need to declutter? Because there's something that's weighing down and causing me not to walk close to the Lord like I should. <laughs> Quite a little storm here, you know. Paul's on this boat. <laughs> uh, it's gone on for several days. And then Paul has a dream. I call it unwavering word. Now, have you ever talked to an angel? Now, no, no nudging your wife. She might be an angel, but just don't do that here in the service. Have you ever talked to an angel? I don't know if I've ever talked to an angel or not. Can I say this? If you have a lot of dreams uh, during the night and visions during the day, just be careful with them. Make sure any dream or vision that you claim to have, make sure that it falls in line with what the scripture says. Because if it doesn't fall in line with what the scripture says, it didn't come from the Lord. So it's very important to understand, how does God direct us today? God directs us uh, by guiding us by his spirit through his word. Now, remember, in New Testament times, they didn't have a printed Bible. And in Old Testament times, so God often directed them with dreams and visions. But we have the completed, sufficient word of God today. All scripture. Give my inspiration of God. And it's proper doctrine for truth, for correction, for instruction in right, how to live. It's there, instruction in righteousness. Can I say this? When Paul got that angel, verse 23 says, and there stood by me this night an angel of God to whom I belong and I serve. He says, do not be afraid. And then he goes down to say, he says, therefore take heart, men, for I believe God that it shall be just as it was told me. You know, Paul expected God to do exactly what he said. There was no hesitation. Paul expected God to do exactly what he said. There are 66 books that make up the Bible. And they are sufficient, absolutely sufficient, for our journey in this life. And what God says, listen, if God said it, just trust it. Expect God to do exactly what he says. I don't know if you've ever read the story of the life of D.L. Moody. I have a couple of times. I, I visited D.L. Moody's grave. It's in Northfield, Massachusetts. And a school that he started that's down that area. He was a 19th century evangelist. And he was crossing the Atlantic in November of 1892 when the ship he was on had an accident at sea. And all the lower cabins of the ship started to fill with water. And everybody was mighty fearful that that vessel was going to, was going to sink. 
And so they, they got the lifeboats ready and so on. And they realized that they had more people than they had room for in the lifeboats. And it was, it was a quite a night. Everybody was fearful. They all met in a saloon uh, down by the first row of cabins. And uh, they figured that it was just a matter of time and they were going under the water. Anyway, the ship didn't sink that night. And they woke up the next morning and Mr. Moody was, uh, he, he, uh, he, he stood in front of the people. He had, he had one arm around a post of the ship and in the other hand, he had a Bible. And he turned to read something out of the Bible and he read Psalm 91. And when he got to one verse, verse 11, God seemed to really make it stick out to him. And verse 11 said this, I find it here in my notes uh, here in just a minute. Yeah. He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. And he said, Lord, it says that you have angels looking after me and you're going to keep me. It seemed that God was impressing that on his heart. So that night he went to bed again. He, they all were all so tired they, they fell asleep. In the middle of the night, Moody's son, who was traveling with him, woke him up and said, Dad... Dad, I, I think your prayers have been answered. He said, you know the flares that we sent up in the sky that we were in distress? Another ship nearby saw the flares and has come to our rescue. And they're going to take all of us off this sinking boat. And Moody said, yes, God had answered. You see, if the Lord says he'll look after you, guess what? He will. Expect God to do what he has said. In this ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are grieved through various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, it says in Peter, is much more precious than gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, that it might be found to praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. All of us remember that, have good memories of, of the late Dr. Billy Graham, don't we? And his wife, Ruth. Billy Graham's, uh, we started out at the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association years ago. One of his friends, a graduate of Bob Jones University, was, was with his side, on his side, and did preaching along with Billy Graham. T.W. Wilson was his name. Many people called him Grady Wilson. Um, Mr. Wilson uh, said this in something that he wrote, and I, I retrieved it. He said, there is a wonderful sense of being in God's presence as you let your mind dwell on God's word. Wonderful sense of being in God's presence. As you let your mind dwell in his word. You know the Lord's given us some wonderful promises. Number one, he said he'd never leave us. How many think that's a lie? Nobody? He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. So if he said he would never leave us or forsake us, God will do what he said. Is that right? He said he would supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory. Is he good for that? You see, in the middle of a storm, when you don't know what's going to happen, when you don't know how it's going to turn out for you personally, what are the storm chips that, that you can devour to give you some comfort for your soul? One of them is you can rest assured that this unexpected weather you're going through is designed by God for his glory and your good. Another thing you can realize is uh, check your life and declutter and get rid of all these unnecessary weights you might be carrying. And the other thing that should bring you comfort is when God has said something, he doesn't waver. He doesn't back out. He doesn't say, oh, sorry, guess circumstances have changed. No, 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 no. He keeps his word. Now, I don't have much time left. Can I just say this? I want to talk about this unusual wreck. <laughs> you, you helped me read it this morning. And um, it was obvious that this, this ship wasn't made of a steel structure. It wasn't a steel hull. It was boards. Again, when I go back to Camp Bell, there was a man there. His name was Maurice Fletcher. And he had a boat building business. And on occasion, I would go down and watch him build a boat. He was building big fishing boats. And I would watch him how he would take the lumber and put it in a vise and, you know, put a curve in that, in that lumber. And then I would watch him how he, how he put that on the frame and how he did it with wood pegs, not with nails that would rust. 
And, and then when he got all the pieces of wood together to form the hull, he would caulk the crack between each one of the boards. It, 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 was, it was quite amazing to watch. It was quite a skill. And here, this was one of those boats that was made of wood. And, and the wind and the waves were beating on that. And it seems that they were in shallow water and they were hitting some rocks and all that kind of thing. And then the, the boat broke apart. And people grabbed on parts of the ship and on boards and that's how they got to land. I don't know about you, but it was an unusual wreck. Wow. Can I say this? Our world throws away broken things. God uses broken things. Anybody here remember the story of Gideon going up against the Midianites? Remember that story? We haven't got time to go into all of it. Do you remember the 300 men, how they conquered the Midianites? What did they have? They had a trumpet, they had a light, and they had a water pitcher. And the light was inside the water pitcher. Remember that? And they surrounded the Midianites, and at a certain point they cried out, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And then what did they do? They broke the water pitcher, and now the lights were all around the Midianites, and they were scared because they thought they were demons, and they killed each other. God used broken pottery. You know, pottery speaks of the broken body, right? We, we're just earth to earth, dust to dust, ashes to ashes. I probably agree with that. God uses broken things. I think of St. Paul who had his thorn in the flesh. I'm not sure what it was. But God used St. Paul. My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in your weakness. I think of Jacob. He wrestled with an angel and it was through the breaking of Jacob's natural strength he ended up limping, didn't he? That he was clothed with God's power. All of this pictures how we achieve in the Christian life. So if you're broken and sick and ailing, don't give up because you might just be in the place where God can use you. Isn't that amazing? Now I got three minutes. Oh dear, I wish we could throw that clock away. I got some names here behind me. They're, oh, they're coming up. There, there they are. Now I'm not going to try to pronounce Nick's last name or what he's got. But can I just tell you that word that starts with P refers to the condition of Nick. Nick was born without arms and without legs. And when he comes to speak in the church, he they, they, they lift him up and put him on the top of the table. Nick is an evangelist. He lives in California. He has an awful trouble past. At age 10, he tried to commit suicide. But he's able to drive a car without arms and legs. He's married and has four kids. And he's a great evangelist. Look at me. God uses broken things. Anybody here know Johnny Erickson Tata? I've met her. She's really broken. She misjudged the shallowness of the water in Chesapeake Bay and dove in and broke bones four and five in her vertebrae. And she's paralyzed from here down. She has written over 40 books, recorded several musical albums, starred in a movie of her life, in 2007, started an organization called Johnny and Friends International Disability Center. She is on the radio on 1,000 stations a week. In 2010, she had stage three breast cancer. She had a mastectomy and chemotherapy, and she has been given six honorary degrees. Look at me. God uses broken things. Oh, you say, Pastor, I got so many things wrong with me physically. I mean, it's just bad shape. Great. If you're broken, don't quit. Because you'll be in contact with people that the rest of us won't be. God uses broken things. So if you're in the middle of a storm, you say, I got cancer. Nobody wants to hear that word. My heart is failing. I got fluid. I got ALS. Remember, 
You're not set aside. Now, God wants to use you. And listen, you don't have to have a broken body to, to be broken. David said after he confessed his sin with Bathsheba, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. You know what you have to have to be used of God? You have to have a broken heart, a clean heart, a clean life, and be pliable in God's hands. I gotta stop it. You see your calling, brethren? How that not many, can you help me? Not many wise men after flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world and the weak things. I've, I've been in Johnny Eric's, Eric's taught us presence. Weak. <laughs> She's weak, physically. But God uses her. So guess what? God can use you and me. Isn't it good to know when you're in the middle of the storm that God still uses broken things? Great comfort, isn't it? Oh, Lord. Thank you for your hand on our lives. How merciful and gracious and kind and loving you are. May from our lives go forth a reflection of Jesus and may others come to trust him through our testimony. In Jesus' name, amen.